Lord, we're grateful for this time together and this beautiful day. How we thank you for the seasons. And we thank you for the things we learn through the winter, time when everything is buried and then when uh, there's a breaking out and you can still see the evidences of death and slumber. And then the springing forth of this time of year, the flowering. Uh, we are just grateful, Lord. We think of that beautiful scene in the latter part of Excalibur where the men are riding on horseback and the king is again well and possessing his kingdom and the magnificent orchard of blossoms. And Lord, we know that it won't be long by your grace before we see that physically around us as the buds strain to spring forth, but we thank you that we also see that spiritually. We're reminded of the words of David. Blessed is the man who meditates in the word day and night. He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in his season. And we praise you, Lord, that we will bring forth fruit in our season. We ask that you brood upon our time of fellowship and study this day and write these truths in the fleshy tables of our heart for Christ's sake with thanksgiving. Amen. Will you turn in your Bibles if you want to follow along, please? And I'm going to use my Williams translation, which is a favorite of mine this morning, uh, to Galatians chapter 4. We'll read a few different passages here. Galatians chapter 4. Now, may the Lord quicken our spirits to understand, giving us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Because these are some things that God's been <clears throat> teaching me in the fire and have become very precious to me, and I trust that they will to you. Did you ever think of how <clears throat> for many, many years, in fact, too often for centuries, believers will, of course, when they're brand new Christians, they get saved and they're full of joy and enthusiasm, and then they uh, kind of level off and... Uh, lose much of their enthusiasm and uh, get into the doldrums and if they're in a really bad situation then they stagnate and that happens in too many lives and a large part of the reason for that is because the church contrary to the clear teaching of the New Testament does not has not been structured to teach people and to encourage people to keep on keeping on and really growing there are some phony definitions that uh, become uh, all too prevalent about what growth is. <clears throat> For example, growth is processing information. Growth is mastering doctrinal content. Growth is knowing what we believe above our necktie and between our ears. And so we follow in the syndrome of the rationalistic culture in which we've all been raised, and you can't help but be tainted by it deeply, culturally conditioned by it because it's like a London fog. You can't even shut it out, they tell us, in, in the houses in London. It, uh, if it's there long enough, it even gets into the house. And it's the same with our culture. And, uh, you know, we're so close to it, we don't realize that culture wasn't always that way. And the whole Western world has been very oriented toward uh, being heady, high-minded. That has its advantages, to be sure, too. It's produced a great technological society and all of the materialistic advantages that we enjoy. We like uh, when we want to get someplace in a hurry, get in a good automobile or on a jet plane. And we enjoy television and all those benefits. But the thing is that it has gone to such an extreme that the best minds and the most perceptive spirits in society tell us that now man is made in the image of his machines and how true that is, in the image of his computers. And as a result of it, he's lost a lot of contact with his feelings and with his deep heart. Because we're a whole lot more than our consciousness. Our consciousness is simply our ego. Our consciousness is our present state of mind, our present point of view. But there's a lot more to us than that. And you know that the Bible said for over 3,000 years now, Solomon said, keep your heart with all diligence. The deep part, what the psychiatrists refer to as the unconscious. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Jesus always addressed himself not to the head. In fact, I don't know how anyone can read the New Testament and see Jesus constantly teaching in parables, 
and similes and allegories and that kind of thing in, uh, uh, and metaphors. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, it just popped into my mind that uh, Werner Heisenberg, who's one of the truly great physicists of our uh, age, said uh, that uh, physicists have learned to go by the head and beyond our intellectual factor and to speak in similes, metaphors, and allegories that's the language of the heart. And the more they penetrate the mysteries of uh, matter, the more the physicist loses the confidence that he once had in his mind that if you can figure it out and it's logical, then you've got a handle on it and you can control it. And that's what our society and culture is all about. But God has told us for years, and Jesus said, look, it is not the way you go through your external rituals. It is what comes out of the heart that defiles the man. And Jeremiah said, someday God's going to give us a new covenant. 700 years before Jesus, he said, someday God's going to give us a new covenant. And in this case, God is going to put it in our hearts and in our spirits. And it won't be external. It won't be written on stone. And then, of course, Jesus came along and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And he, had, he, uh, he inaugurated, initiated that covenant. This cup is the new uh, covenant in my blood. Well, what is the new covenant about? And you read all about it through the New Testament, but one of the things is uh, you are manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink. See, that's external. That's the letter. But with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshy tables of the heart. And so God wants us to realize that there's a world within us that every good uh, spirit has come to realize those who really apply themselves to finding out what the inner mysteries are that the world within us is larger than the world outside of us then of course there's the great truth that if you do get in touch with the world within you as Goethe once put it and I was so fascinated with this statement in fact I wrote a manuscript on it I have it now he said uh, the beginning of all he said literary activity but I'm going to paraphrase it and say the beginning of all creative activity is the shaping of the world around us by means of the world that's within us. Well, amen. The beginning of all creative activity is the shaping of the world around us by means of the world that's within us. Now, supposing Christians should begin to recover what our brothers and sisters had back in medieval times and New Testament times and before that, and knew how to get in touch with their hearts, learn how to listen to their dreams, learn how to lim uh, listen to the images and metaphors and similes, the symbols that pop out of the heart. Learn how to listen to their hunches. Learn how to develop their intuition. Learn how to listen to the still, small voice which God speaks about continuously. Today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your heart. And learn how to begin to really get in touch with that and use the tremendous power. And I like to teach on this. It's said sometimes we can teach the things best that we're ourselves learning and how true that is. Uh, imagination. The power of creative imagination to create the world around us by means of the world that's within us. The power of the images that God holds before the eye of our spirit. Jesus said, if your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. And David prayed something about that in Psalm 86, 11. He said, unite my heart to fear thy name. You see, they were always dealing not with that little bit that shows above the surface of the iceberg, you know, the one-tenth. Nine-tenths of it's out of sight, and that's very like our, our minds and hearts. The one-tenth of the iceberg that sticks up here is the conscious mind, and most of Western culture has had to do with that. And it's heavily permeated our Christianity, heavily permeated our institutional Christianity, so that we think, boy, if we teach people information, and they process information and can feed it back to us in parrot fashion, much like we take our exams in schools for A's, B's, and C's, that will make a victorious Christian. And yet, so many times the churches are dead. You know it as well as I do. And people who have mastered doctrinal content and the rest of it are anything but vibrant, uh, enthusiastic, adventuring Christians. Something's been turned off in them. They've been cut off from their hearts. They don't get these wonderful balloons that God wants to let come from below the surface of the water and pop up into their consciousness. All of that has been sealed off uh, and a lid has been put on it. And so they're really locked up in about one-tenth of their consciousness in the analogy to the iceberg. But God says, I'm dealing with a big part down here.
uh, your Christ epistles, not written with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshy tables of the heart, in the deep part of the being. For out of the heart these things come. And Jesus said, out of your inner being will flow rivers of living water. So we want to address ourselves to that. If you look at uh, Galatians 4, when we're young in the Lord, this is essential, what we're going to read about here. But supposing, you know, God says, I want you to grow up, which he says here. And he is given, as we read in Ephesians 4, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to perfect the saints in the work of the ministry under the building up of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature man. Now you see, God's thrust is that we should become a mature new humanity. Each one of us contributing from the standpoint of our increasing maturity the gifts and the contributions out of our own hearts that he's given us to give to the body of Christ. But supposing that you knock off the apostles and those troublesome prophets and say they all died in the first century, which the Bible never did say, and you end up, you have pastors, evangelists, and teachers, and the evangelists and the teachers are subordinate to the pastors, and so the pastor stands all by himself as the lone man in a given situation, not being surrounded by peers, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and uh, teachers, and he's in a lonely, isolated position, which is one of the worst positions known to mankind. And you could read about what happened to a man who really began to get honest, who was thrust into that position. My friend Bob Gerard, our friend Bob Gerard, wrote a book several years ago called Brethren Hang Loose about church renewal back in the mid-early 70s. But then when he began to follow the Spirit in, in revamping and revising the traditional structure of his church, God zeroed in on him. That's what always happens. If God can get us outside of our protective parameters, then he isolates us into individuality and starts dealing with us as people individually. And that can be a hairy and very interesting trip, but a very essential one if we're going to grow up. And he's written a more recent book called My Weakness, His Strength. Uh, that's written by Bob Gerard and published by Zondervan, and I want to mention that to you, and I'll give it to you again at the end of the uh, session if you're interested in it. But he tells about his own spiritual adventure, about his spiritual quest, and about the dark valleys that he went through and the mountain peaks and the rest of it in finding out some new things from God. But he also tells about the loneliness of the pastor, the fact that when he was the top dog, that uh, as long as he put his total energies into that Wesleyan Methodist Church in Scottsdale, Arizona, and kept all of the subcommittees running while everything went humming along, but it was a constant stress and strain to do it. And the minute he went on vacation or got ill or something like that, and he, w he just felt like he was out straight all the while, and he'd find himself with increasingly violent reactions at home where he could let his hair down and let his mask down a bit, that the minute that he relaxed, the thing started grinding to a halt. And he started asking, where is the Holy Spirit in this? Much in the fashion that Juan Carlos Ortiz did in his excellent book called A Discipleship. The same thing happened in his big church in Buenos Aires. Uh... And uh, God got him out into isolation in the wilderness and said, Where am I in all this? He said, You're selling Christianity like you'd sell Coca-Cola or peanuts. And he said, You haven't even listened to me. And Bob Gerard came to the same conclusion, I'm not listening, say. Well, if you get into that kind of situation, then the system becomes an end-all. It becomes the purpose. The organization is the end of it. The New Testament, the organization, was never the end of it. It isn't an organization. It's an organism. The church is an organism filled with resurrection life. What's the most important thing? People. Individuals. Christ would have died for you alone had you been the only one to ever live. And it is not the organization, and bigger is better, and more is better, and production is better. It's the individual. And the values that God's planted in the heart of that individual, that's what Christ came to do. He didn't build an organization. He built an organism. We are his body. And if you leave that poor pastor out there all by himself and he's not surrounded by peers, the system will close up, the system will become an end-all, and you'll find yourself serving the cause instead of finding out who you are and who you were created to be in Christ Jesus, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus 
unto good works which God before ordained that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. And there's coming a time when this planet will be incinerated, according to the word of God and the prophets. And everything will be burned up. The earth and the works that are therein, Peter tells us, will be burned up. And what do you think will abide the fire? The only thing that will abide the fire is the organism. Believers. Living believers. Not organizations. Not budgets, buildings, and baptisms. Not bigger is better. Not more is better. But people... And you know there's a lot of things that we'll not take with us that we'll have to leave behind, including our bank accounts. And as said there of a truth in cliches, you can't take it with you. And you can't take that with you. But there is something you can take with you. And it's what you're becoming today. We're developing the capacity for God that we'll carry and continue to develop through eternity in the ages to come. He'll continue to show forth the riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. We're becoming what we're going to be. Now, the Word of God says in 1 Corinthians 15, there's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. One star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. We're becoming what we're going to be. What kind of heart do you have? You see, Jesus put a great emphasis on that. He said, blessed... He didn't didn't say, blessed are those who have greater budgets, buildings, and baptisms. He said, blessed are those that mourn, for they'll be comforted. Blessed are the poor, for the riches of the kingdom of God belong to them. And then he said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That isn't easy to purify the heart. That isn't easy. That isn't easy to develop a larger capacity. See, the world within us is larger than the world around us. And it isn't easy to let God extend the reign of his kingdom, for the kingdom of God is where? Within us. It isn't easy to let God extend his reign further and further into our being. But that's what Christianity is all about, that Jesus might be Lord. Romans 14, to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord of the dead and living. And so my part is to respond to his lordship. Your part is to respond to his lordship and to pay attention to that inner quest of letting Jesus Christ extend his reign and discovering who you are in Christ Jesus, because what are you? He hath made us unto our God, kings, and priests, and we shall reign on the earth, Revelation 1 tells us, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now I'm going to finally get around to reading that passage I mentioned a long time back, Galatians chapter 4. And if you listen to me very often, you'll realize my wife is always amused with that, but That's the way I usually operate, announce that and then straightway depart from it. Galatians 4, I mean this, as long as the heir is under age, he is not a whit better off than a slave. Now here is a child who is an heir in uh, ostensibly a a well-to-do home. As long as he is under age, he's not a whit better off than a slave. Now you know back in those Roman and Grecian homes they had slaves, and slaves weren't always people who did the pots and pans. Many times they were... Pedagogues are teaching slaves. They were the teachers in the house. They were the tutors. And uh, sometimes very dear to the household and almost like family members, but legally they had no status. They were slaves. They didn't own themselves. And so the heir is very like that when he's in his minority. As long as he, uh, the heir is underage, he's not a whit better off than a slave. So I said earlier I'm reading from William's translation. Although he's heir of all the property... But he's under guardians and trustees until the time fixed by the Father. Now, Paul uses this as an illustration. So when we were spiritually under age, we were slaves to the world's crude notions. Now, please hear that carefully. Because I'm not going into this this morning in great detail. In fact, uh, that particular emphasis the Spirit led us into last night. But if you look, if you're following along in your Bibles, if you look down at verse 9, Paul is very distressed with these Galatian Christians about 10 to 14 years after he brought them to Christ. He says in verse 9, Since you've come to know God, or rather come to be known by Him, how can you turn back to your own crude notions so weak and worthless and wish to become slaves to them again? What were they doing? They were regressing. That's what I began to talk about this morning. The fact that many times 
The church institutionally is designed to keep people frozen at an inferior pattern of growth. They are not encouraged to go on in their spiritual quest to maturity. Now, there's a great hunger to go on to maturity. There's a general hunger. There's a great breakthrough today. It's reflected on all sides. For example, uh, we've had uh, movies like Excalibur. Where did Excalibur come from? It's based uh, by a person who certainly knew the ancient legend of the Holy Grail inside out in his spirit. And it's a story, uh, you know, that uh, legend began as far as we can tell about the 12th century. It's one of the more recent legends of mankind. But it's a story totally of the inner quest, the legend of the Holy Grail. And that's why movies like that have been so popular, because there is great spiritual hunger. The Clash of the Titans reflected some of the same thing. So people today, they couldn't tell you that. Maybe 90% of the people seated in the theater wouldn't tell you that. <clears throat> but they're attracted in their hearts, the same as the younger generation has bought up Tolkien's writings by the multi-thousands, because it's speaking not to the head. It's speaking symbolically to the heart. God intended that the church should be an enchanted people who would reflect glory. Glory is an upstairs word, and by upstairs I mean fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh dimensional word. Jesus prayed when he went to the cross, Father, restore unto me the glory that I had with thee before the world was. And the Holy Spirit wouldn't come until he was glorified again, John 7:39. The Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so he said, give me back my glory. And God did glorify him. He raised him to the dead. Glory is an upstairs word. It's when Jesus goes back into the presence of God. Now he tells us, but we all with unveiled face in 2 Corinthians 3, behold and reflect as from a mirror the glory of the Lord. You see, it's our task to reflect in flashes of glory what God gives us in our spirit from those other dimensions. That's why we're a heavenly people, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood so that we can begin to reflect down here in the darkness as children of light something of what eternity must be like. Instead of that, many times we get frozen into an institutional form that encourages us to remain children. That's what Paul's complaining about. He says, now after that you've known God, why are you turning back to these weak beggarly elements, these crude worldly notions? What is the world's notion? To make yourself spiritual by trying harder and living according to externalities, external rules, guidelines and principles well that's not God's way that's all right in the time of our minority verse 3 again here so when we were spiritually underage we were slaves to the world's crude notions but when the proper time had come God sent his son born of woman born subject to law to ransom those who were subject to law how do we guide our lives are we subject to law do we guide our lives by external codes and creeds? God says, I've got something far better than that. That's external. That'll lead to spiritual death, wrath, multiplication of transgressions, strengthening of sin. New Testament says all of those things. I've just quoted scripture, four different scriptures. That if you are locked into that kind of a syndrome of guiding your life by externalities, and you have to look, uh, having been to the convention, and they handed you a uh, large tome that you probably paid $55 to register and get. And if you look on page 1,933 in subparagraph A as to what to do in this particular situation, that's the world's crude notions. That's the world's brand of religion. It has to do with ethics and morality and externalities. It has nothing to do with the problem of life within and Christianity has to do with resurrection life within. We don't go out and legislate to the trees at this time of year and say, Thou shalt spring forth and bud and start acting like a tree. You've been barren long enough. We know that it will spring forth and bud. Why? Because it has life in it. And that's what God tells us about the new covenant. When Christ, who is our life, Paul didn't say to me to live is to try to be like Jesus. He said to me to live is Christ. It's Christ in us, living out through us. He put his very life. We're partakers of the divine nature, according to 2 Peter 1.4, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. Now, we need to get away from the elementals, which come to us so naturally, which were all right when we were in a minority. But notice what God says we are now in Galatians 
Because your sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, that is father. Your sons now, mature sons, huioi in the Greek, not techno, children, but huioi, mature sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son where? Not into your head, but into your heart, crying, Abba, father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir by God's own act. Oh, that's really good. I want to read another passage back here, and it's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the great love chapter. Paul refers to this. Just a few verses here. 1 Corinthians 13.10 But when perfection comes, what is imperfect will be set aside. When I was a child, I talked like a child. You know, it's perfectly appropriate for a newborn babe in Christ to act like a newborn babe in Christ. To want to be taken care of, uh, just like a baby would in the home. But after a little while, that is no longer appropriate. What's appropriate to our little grandson that we affectionately call Pooker? We have three... Uh, grandsons and one little granddaughter. Our, we were delighted to have a new little granddaughter born uh, into our family on March uh, 3rd. And uh, she makes her demands. And, and uh, people spring into action when she makes her demands or when Pooker uh, wants to act like a cute little kid and uh, play in the cat food and sometimes eat a little bit of it before we can catch him. Why, that's fine, but you know, uh, if I came back 15 years from now and found Pooker eating cat food and still waddling around in diapers, I tell you I would be more than disappointed. And I'm sure that the Spirit of God feels the same way when he finds his spiritual Pookers doing the same thing. Frozen at a level of growth instead of going on. Paul says, forgetting the things which are behind and straining forth unto the things which lie before. I press toward the mark. So he says this, when I was a child, I, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. You know, it would be nice if in a given church sometime, God would just transform us physically into the situation physically where we are spiritually. Now, you know what you would see? <laughs> you would see the pastor wheeling sometimes 220-pound men around in diapers sucking on lollipops because they've never grown. They've been stagnated and frozen. A lot of the times it's the pastor's fault. Now, thank God for godly pastors who say, hey, my task is not to freeze this person at this level and make him a productive unit. My task is to lead this person on to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus so that he can get off on his own and become independent and hear God for himself and be guided by the Holy Spirit. He doesn't need to always be under my thumb. Amen. And there are pastors like that. In fact, we'll have a conference with a pastor like that in Erie, Pennsylvania, and there are many others across the country. But there are many that are not only isolated and lonely because they don't have peers around them to help give them some input and let go of these sheep. God didn't intend you forever to keep people sheep. You know what? Uh, I, I had an interesting time with the Board of Elders one time. I got so sick of hearing them say, We've got to protect these sheep. Well, some of these sheep were about 50 to 75 years old spiritually, and they were still just big, fat sheep waddling around in circles. What good are they? Except to shear. And I said to the Lord, what are we going to do about this? I really grated my spirit to hear this. I mean, some of these people were the same as they had been years and years before. And God gave me a perfect verse. He popped it right into my spirit, and then I shared it with the elders, and then they wanted to burn me at the stake. <laughs> I said, you know what God wants to do with your sheep? Romans 8. It is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. You know what God wants to do with big fat sheep? You know why he raised them in the first place? He wants to take them to the cross. God didn't intend that they should always be earthbound sheep. He wants them to become kings and princes. For thy sake we're killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. God doesn't want us to continue to wall around circus. Cir circus is right. Circles. Because it is a circus. He wants us to grow up in him. So Paul says, now we see a dim reflection in a looking glass, but 
then we'll see face to face. Now I know what is imperfect, but then I'll know perfectly as God knows me. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. You go back to Galatians 4 where it says we're like, even though we're heirs, we're like the slave in the house until we come to the time of our maturity, or our majority. In other words, we can't play with a checkbook and that kind of thing as long as we're small children. But God says, I don't want you to stay that way. You're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, and I put the spirit of my son within you. And I want you to grow up as he grew up. He learned obedience through the things that he suffered, and being made mature, he became the author of eternal salvation to those that obey him. Now, what happens to us? Things like this happen to us. Years ago, one of the great uh, high mountain peaks, and I've had many of them, for which I thank God, and I've had some very deep, deep valleys, too. That's part of the Christian life. But one of the great high days in the Lord was when God led me to the Experimental Institute for Human Development at Princeton with Bruce Larson and Keith Miller. Now, I'd never met Bruce Larson. I'd read some of his books, and I didn't go there, frankly, to meet Bruce Larson. I went there to meet my friend Jess Lair, the author, and I'd recommend his books to you. He wrote uh, some interesting books that would be helpful to Christians uh, or to anybody called uh, I Ain't Much Baby, But I'm All I've Got, and I Ain't Well, But I Sure Am Better. And a lot of times, a little different vantage point will help a Christian break out of some of his straitjackets and see things from a different angle. And Jess wrote some beautiful stuff. So I went to meet him. We'd become friends over the telephone, and when we met, felt like we'd known one another for a hundred years. But uh, there were 300 people from 38 states and five foreign countries there for this experimental institute. There had been a large grant from the Lilly Foundation. It was very costly uh, for people to get there, and there was quite a stiff fee to pay when they did get there. And so they came at some expense and effort. And the interesting thing is that among those 300 people from 38 states and five foreign countries, there was an across-the-spectrum representation. Bruce Larson and Keith Miller were running the show, and uh, there were people who were atheists, agnostics, humanists, there were Roman Catholics, Jews, Christians of every stripe and variety, from liberal to ultra-conservative. So you had a very interesting microcosm of people there. And uh, God fell on that camp. Some of the outstanding minds and hearts from around the world were brought there to the faculty. Men like the world-renowned psychiatrist R.D. Lang, Carlisle Marnie, Say nothing to Bruce and Keith and Walter Leckler and Jess Lair and people like that. But God so fell on the place that all lines of distinction between faculty and those who were there as conferees were erased. And I saw some of the most spectacular healings and miracles that I've ever seen in my life. And uh, On the last Saturday, we had a great testimony time after having a celebration victory dance the night before. And on the last Saturday morning, I remember to this day seeing a tall, willowy uh, lady stand up, uh, approaching middle age, a graduate of Vassar. And uh, she had her distinguished gray-haired husband, who was obviously quite a bit older, probably 15, 20 years older than she was, professor at the University of Washington, seated next to her. And she stood up and gave a very moving testimony. That was a marvelous morning, in fact, R.D. Lang stood up and gave a testimony, and he had been very anti-Christian about how God had touched him during that week. And I tell you, it was a a week of miracles. But this woman stood up and said, uh, I was born in a Presbyterian missionary's home. And she said, uh, I can remember to this day, because I'll tell you, the mask came off, the walls came down, between those 300 people more rapidly than I guess I've seen them in most any other time in my life, except, thank God, we've had some of those times since. And the true being came out. And here was a very sophisticated lady who had been brought up in Presbyterian circles, and she said, my father was a very distinguished, aristocratic Presbyterian minister. And she said, I remember in our large home one day that I came down early in the morning when I was a little girl, and I 
found my father in his study, and he was reading, as was his custom every morning, his devotions. And she said, I crawled up on his knee because I wanted to be with him. And she said, all of these things have come back vividly to me this week. And she said, he pushed me gently but firmly off his lap and said, Not now, daughter. Father is fellowshipping with God. And he made sure that I made my exit from the room. And she said, I remember other incidents. For example, he went as a missionary later with a family to the Middle East. And she said, I remember one terrible night on the Mediterranean that there had been insurrection in the country where we were living. And my father decided that it was his duty to God to stay. And so he took us down on a terrible night when it was raining so that he could hardly see uh, three feet into the storm and put us in a little tiny shell of a boat to go out to a liner. And she said, I thought we'd perish in those huge waves that night. And I saw him disappearing into the darkness as he left my mother and myself just fend for ourselves and go out to that ocean liner. And she said, then I remember when we got back home that he was absent continuously and I never knew him. And she said, I never realized how much this bent my spiritual life out of shape. And she was saying these things in tears. And then she said, and uh, you notice that I've married a wonderful man who is quite a few years my senior because I'm still looking for my father. And she said, I never realized that until this week. And she said, uh, still puts a lump in my throat, I can still see that scene. She turned and said uh, to her husband, I want you to know that from now on you not only have a, a, a daughter, you really have a wife. Well, what had happened to that girl? Just exactly what Paul's talking about and what I'm getting at this morning. As long as we're stuck in that one-tenth of our consciousness, the ego, our present point of view, which is above the surface of the water, we don't realize what our hearts do to us. What is unconscious, the dragons and everything else that are down in the nine-tenths that are out of sight are always bending our life and twisting our lives out of shape, distorting our view of everything, including God. Can you imagine the view that that girl had of God? You know, we first take, those of us who have opportunity, our first impressions of God many times will come from our father image. And I've wondered why God took me through some heavy fires and I understand so much more clearly now that was to burn out ancient concepts of God that are not accurate or relevant at all. Do you know what happens when we train children? We not only have our ego sticking up there above the water, but there's a little adjunct to it. I think you're... Oh, okay. Your tape just went there. Pause. Praying children, you not only have your ego or your present point of view, but you also have what's known as superego. It's a little adjunct to the ego. Very, very valid concept. Every good psychologist would tell you that that's true. And what is that? It's like when we're training the children now, our grandchildren. We, The oldest one is a very vigorous fellow, Caleb. And uh, when he used to come over, he'd want to run his little steel truck across the glass coffee table in the condominium, fiddle with the dials on the television, and do a few other destructive things. Well, he soon learned when we said no, he uh, proceeded to do it anyway, but then uh, Grandpa, if I were near him, would grab him and set him down on the floor good and hard, you know, so that his ears would vibrate a little bit, like my father used to do with me, or my mother. And uh, then he'd cry, and then we'd make up. <laughs> 
And, you know, he got to the place, he's four years old now, where you could trust him in the room without fiddling with the television dials, without uh, making scratches on the coffee table. Why? Because he had internalized the authority figure of grandpa, grandma, father, and mother into his superego. That's good. That makes us civilized human beings, or at least helps a whole lot, so that we can function in society, so that we don't become pagans, cannibals and exploit the daylights out of one another we learn how to behave ourselves that's called superego and that's good in the time of our minority but supposing you get the austere rejection that that young lady that I told you about did and many of us have had all of us have some experiences like that and believe me it's utterly fatal to sit around the rest of your life and dump on daddy and mama and say they bent me out of shape and look at the terrible Thing that has been done to me and my life is forever ruined baloney that's your problem I'm not suggesting that for one minute that's totally irresponsible nonsense God expects us to grow up there's not a parent on this planet who is perfect they did the best they could where they were in all likelihood and uh, some of us were bent out of shape more than others but it's time to cope with that to deal with it and to grow out of it but in any case these authority figures get uh, in interjected into our lives or ingested into our lives and become part of our soul, our psyche. And if you get a very authoritarian figure, or many of them, teachers, policemen, pastors, teachers, uh, religious teachers, what have you, then we're driven to perfectionism, for example. What a curse that is so that everything has to be exactly in its spot and we are utterly in distress if it isn't and we must be in control at all times and if it isn't that way then we feel guilty or if we don't fulfill our neurotic little duties we feel guilty and that's emotional imbalance that's a soul sickness and all of us have experienced it in degree and you know we begin to think that God's very like that that if I ever show God that I can get angry at him, that he'll snuff me, because I couldn't even get angry at my parents without getting whacked back. And so you never get angry with God. And so there are times when God does some unspeakable things from our standpoint that make you angry, and what do you do? You swallow it. And it gives you a severe block. And then uh, somebody says, do you have anger? I said to a lady last night who uh, we prayed for some healing for, and she had arthritis, and I'm not suggesting and don't draw any conclusions that all arthritis come from that type of thing or that anybody could be immediately healed from arthritis. I'm not suggesting anything of the sort. I had it myself 25 years ago, and God saw fit to heal me, for which I'm very grateful. But we were just trying to listen to the Spirit and help that woman. And she said, but I've had so much continual depression. And I said, what are you angry about? Are you angry about anything? And it was a beautiful, loving atmosphere. And she said, yes, I guess I have been, as she reflected on it. I said, my friend Jess Lair has a good definition of anger. I guess he borrowed it from somebody else, but he beautifully repeated it, that uh, depression is frozen rage. She says, you know, that's true. And the others who were in the circle said, I, I think that there's truth in that. The Spirit of God resonated that in our hearts. If, in fact, we are angry, and we say we aren't, it's a lie, and that's heaped on top of our anger to begin with. And we're living in unreality, and we're bent out of shape. Well, now God says, look, if you're going to see me in what I'm really like, listen to this, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I don't need to have an authoritarian God riding around on my back that I pay taxes to all day long with guilt. Jesus Christ did not come and die that I might experience that kind of God. I want to get rid of that kind of God, and God wants me to get rid of that kind of God. That's an image. That is not God. You know, everything we know about God is reflected in our mirror. That's what we just read this morning. Now we see in a mirror dimly, the mirror of our hearts. God says, let me polish your mirror so you can see more clearly. What's one of the things that helped polish that girl's mirror so she went out of there with a lot of healing? If you look back at James, 
the fourth chapter. <clears throat> you know, that same week we had, as I said, that outstanding and intellectual's intellectual, R.D. Lang, the world-renowned psychiatrist, was one of the teachers. You know that God was so heavy on that campus at Princeton that week that when it came Friday, the next to the last day, that right in the middle of his lecture, Lang broke down and wept uncontrollably. God got some garbage out of him, too. He went home and wrote a book, beautiful book called The Facts of Life, in which he said, look to Jesus at the end of the book. God really touched the man that week.